following is my conversation with Matt Skellies. Matt heads supply chain at Chicken of the Sea, an awesome company. By the way, we use their products, happy consumers uh, of, of that company. Matt is a true supply chain visionary, uh, unique, atypical, very practical thinking. Matt and I talked about supply chains both in the pre-COVID and post-COVID context. We talked about a range of topics from accuracy to visibility to agility. And we talked about that how agility in today's age is a lot more important than visibility and uh, accuracy. While you need visibility and you need uh, accuracy, but that cannot come at the cost of agility. Every organization needs its agility muscle and that muscle needs to be built up uh, and the right kind of focus and investments have to go into it. We also talked about how to make forecasting accuracy work. What are some of the techniques and methods, uh, data requirements, organizational prerequisites for all of that? We compared demand signal forecast accuracy versus inventory accuracy. And while they both are important, which accuracy can result in a higher ROI? And at the end of the day, how you connect supply side, demand side, sales and marketing side, and have a connected organization that can take on today's supply chain challenges. Certainly, supply chain importance is more than ever. Matt has a seat at the CEO table. He reports to the CEO. I found this conversation very insightful. I'm sure that many of you, whether you are practitioners, solution providers, or just somebody fascinated and intrigued about supply chains will find this conversation uh, very practical and applicable to real life situations. And now here, is my conversation with none other than Matt Skellies. Matt, my man, how are you? Very good, Amjad. Thank you for the chance to chat. Yeah, no, I, I'm so looking, so looking forward to that. And uh, I uh, uh, was thinking over the past several uh, months that finding an opportunity to uh, to speak with you. I uh, have been a big fan of your. Uh, thinking on uh, supply chain and uh, all related topics. So I think maybe to, to, to start with, supply chain might mean different things to different people. Certainly it has a supply side to it, you know, facing off there, there is a demand side and sometimes you have sales and marketing sitting, you know, in between and other uh, ops or related processes. Just to kind of level set the discussion, how do you, Matt, see the supply chain at a glance, how it is you know, organized or should be organized in types of industries that you, uh, that you work with? So uh, I think that's a good point to, that's a good point to start and sort of, you know, sure. wrap the ap appetite of uh, our audience. Yeah, um, you know, my answer probably has changed uh, over the years. Um, and so I actually come from, uh, a, I'm one of the few people who's actually doing what they went to school for. I, my degree is actually in, in business logistics. And at the time, effectively it was logistics, right? And that came to then be supply chain, which then has, I think the degree now is actually called supply chain and information systems, if I'm not mistaken. So it's kind of even grown organically within, within that element of, of things. But as I've progressed, certainly supply chain um, has evolved over time. 
So I think the the legacy um, thought process I had, uh, and again, I'm somebody who kind of came through more of the customer logistics side of things, kind of more the uh, your traditional warehouse transportation final mile the customer, um, and then certainly uh, as I've had a chance to progress through my career, taking on more of the elements of uh, the procurement side of things now have um, international procurement. So uh, supply chain right now is, uh, uh, as you probably read a lot, it's a, it's a mess, uh, <laughs> specifically internationally with what we're seeing at the ports and, and vessels. Um, but even more than that, um, I've had an opportunity to become part of our executive leadership team. And so I get to sit at the table with my cross-functional counterparts, primarily in marketing and sales to help guide the commercial strategy. And so though supply chain, I guess, is still somewhat nebulous, um, yeah. effectively it, it, it's the operations element and the fact that we ultimately get, get to then have a seat and help dictate what is the go-to-market strategy? What is our three to five year strat plan look like? Um, really kind of in my mind has grown to be much more comprehensive um, in terms of, of where it sits within any organization. Um, and so it really does become difficult to really put guidelines on where does the supply chain start and stop because I'm a lot of meetings are, are with trade fund management and a lot of the sales side of things uh, and interfacing with my marketing counterparts and packaging uh, discussions. Um, and it, it's blurred the lines, which I think is great to be honest with you. I think it's, it's, it's really good for an, an organization to have that more integrated approach um, and, and checks and balances that, that come with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, as of late, I, it is dawning upon me and I'm at learning from other practitioners that this uh, healthy tension and opportunity between visibility, accuracy and agility. And, and what I mean by that is uh, traditionally, there has been a lot of emphasis on uh, on accuracy and inaccuracy more on the uh, demand signal side of things. Uh, but there are other forms of accuracy, like you know, getting to know your inventory position at any given point in time at all different nodes. Then on visibility, um, Matt, when we talk to many colleagues out there in the industry it still looks like that when it comes to transparency and visibility, that there is still a lot of blindness and opaqueness still, still there. You know, maybe people have localized visibility, but not, you know, the type of end-to-end -end transparency that where you can see uh, in a broader sense. And then agility, the what-ifs, you know, truly, simulation rich environments that is just you know very low maturity uh what what sort of your perspective on uh this balance between uh accuracy versus agility versus versus visibility which one of these components uh or capabilities you think uh are, are needed more uh, in the this brave new the brave new world, I think you and I we both would agree to it that uh, supply chain is a lot more than just uh, demand forecasting. Wow, it's almost like you set in my strat plan meetings because I'm I'm the guy who you you pretty much hit the buzzwords that I am like a broken record about. So. Uh, let me take it back about, um, I'd say, 18 months or so as we were planning for, for 2020, um, and nobody could have ever seen what was was coming down the pipe right around mid-March or so and, and, and what the pandemic did. Um, I take a lot of pride in the work that my organization did on a supply chain side in implementing some of the most astounding uh, agility that I, I, I think I've seen in my career. Um, so I have um, responsibility to run a manufacturing plant. And um, obviously, as anybody who, who runs a plant knows, you, you put together a budget, you put together your, your plans, you plan personnel, you plan raw materials, 
uh, and you plan inventory. Well, when all of a sudden panic buying uh, in, in my grocery driven uh, world that I'm in currently right now result in us essentially doing double the amount of volume in the month of March and April that we had planned. You can imagine the, the, the stress it put on our supply chain across the board. We had to scramble uh, to prepare raw materials, to increase our production, uh, and to appropriately, you know, uh, adjust stock levels to accommodate this unprecedented demand. Um, and, and we did so in such a fashion that um, I, I, I'm very, very pleased with the results. We were able to, to steal some share and, and to really improve our, our, our position. And so the agility element uh, is something that is near and dear to my heart as then now we have to put forth a plan and we had to put forth a plan for 2021 budget. Nobody quite knew what that means. How do you budget when your baseline is a year unlike anything you've ever seen? And I think that, you know, we're, we're seeing it bear itself out right now that, you know, nobody necessarily was prepared. And that's why the supply chain is as disrupted as it is right now across the board and will continue to be for some period of time while people feel it out. Um, and so the agility element, I think, is, is absolutely critical. And, and uh, a lot of that just comes uh, down to really challenging yourself on your processes as a, a Six Sigma guy, I'm a planner by nature. I would love to be able to sit here and tell you what my pack plan looks like for the third week in October. I have that right now, but realistically speaking, I know that I need to be agile enough to be able to flex it um, because yeah. um, that, that's, that's what the market entails. Now, what then that speaks to then is again, planner by nature. I would love that 100% forecast accuracy. To be honest, where I'm sitting right now, I would love anything north of 60, 70% <laughs> demand accuracy because that does create um, you know, impacts to the supply chain. And so at the same time that I have to be able to implement the agility to uh, adjust and accommodate, I still have deliverables with respect to managing networking capital to within yeah. budgets. And so um, I don't get to just run the plant 100% capacity without ramifications. And so we do have to plan and we have to implement appropriate safety stock levels. We have to try to run leaner where we can, um, despite the fact that we don't necessarily always know what's coming um, with, with any real um, accuracy level. And so one of the things that I, I, I've grown to appreciate and, and, and in our previous conversations, you know, um, you know, whether it's, it's AI or some of these more sophisticated systems where you can remove the bias and start to look, um, look forward using history as a base, but even when you have a, a, a muddy history like we're coming out of, to kind of just be able to just look at things total open-ended with a fresh set of eyes, whether it's a, yeah. a new person able or a system that doesn't have there there's no preconceived biases there's no status quo they're looking to maintain some of these tools i think um are, are really critical to help us in terms of figuring out how do we accommodate the volatility that's a byproduct of, of this history and and so it's an exciting time uh in supply chain though certainly um you know stressful at the, at the same time given all of the headwinds that we're up against with an inflationary um, pressures on, on, on commodities and, and raw materials. But at the same time, I, I think it's, it's especially exciting because, you know, kind of going back to your first question about supply chain, these are things that then have um, ramifications throughout the entirety of the organization. My, my finance guys need to know exactly what it is I'm doing. Um, and certainly, you know, the sales team needs to know uh, and, and their partners. Uh, and, and so uh, agility, Accuracy, all those things interplay in a way. Probably right now, it's quite a bit more nuanced and unique. But um, I, I think most most supply chain leaders will tell you it, it's exciting. No, no, so 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 true. If we had just for the next maybe few minutes, we pick up uh, demand forecasting. You and I, we both know that historical data would only take you so far, you know, no matter what your math or somebody's math is. And 
then you, you know, maybe if you try to get some data about the future on the demand side, if that is available, can help inform, but then that data starts getting more uh, unstructured and it's not easy to go get that data and what have you. And then forecasting is also both still a science and art. There are things that can be automated, other things that require a human touch. And you have then all these different types of forecasts, your short range tactical, your mid range, your long range strategic ones. So, and then certainly in you know, any organization with its finite resources can't just put all resources on just forecast. It has to be accurate enough to support other functions. Uh, so what is your, Matt, take on if you were to set up in a company processes, people capabilities, systems to go about, you know, forecasting, what would, what would my dear, what would my friend you do? And still today, the majority of the industry out there is just trying to use first party, meaning a company's own data, no industry data, just their own data and historical data and a little bit of future knowledge uh, and then trying to uh, rely upon a silver bullet algorithm, which you and I both know they don't exist. Uh, or uh, These are just tools. So I want for the next few minutes, if it's okay, to go deeper into how to think about uh, that and uh, how would you do that with now all the pre-COVID, post-COVID and multi-industry knowledge uh, of you have seen a lot of what works and what doesn't. And if there is a clean slate approach, how would you, Matt, go about doing this? Well, I'll start with your, your last comment is um, a, a lot of elements in, in supply chain. I always kind of liken us to the, the offensive linemen in, in, in football. We kind of fly under the radar and, until we make a penalty, right? And, and, and cost us, right? And, and so supply chain in a way, um, if you have great forecasting acumen, great forecasting processes, um, nobody's ever going to necessarily pat you on the back, right? Because you're just setting the bar high and, and you just have to deliver on that on that day in, day out. Um, now, that said, there are certainly inherent um, benefits that come with that to the entirety of, of the organization, whether they are proactively realized or not. The ability to run leaner, the ability to, um, it, you know, um, it, there, there's certainly competitive advantages that, that you get as a result. Um, so if you had a crystal ball, I think, uh, you know, sooner or later, people are going to take the crystal ball for granted and say, how do we get even better than this, right? And, and, and so, uh, so go back to, to the original uh, point of your question. Um, forecasting in and of itself is, is a challenge and, and everybody who has an opinion has a different way to, to forecast. And so it's where forecasting in and of itself is critical. But I think it, it ties into kind of things like the SNOP and consensus forecast comparison types of processes where it has to be all eyes wide open as to what are we as a singular business entity going to implement um, for whatever given um, you know, issue we're looking to solve. And that said, that's not always one forecast. And so I know that ultimately when I walk out of our monthly SNOP cycle, I want to be able to hand a demand forecast, uh, shipment demand forecast in cases to my supply planning team and basically say, okay, go make sure we're, we're prepared for this. Well, I'm in that same meeting with folks from, from finance who they don't necessarily care about the cases per se. They want to see that dollarized and how is that tracking versus budget and versus previous forecast iterations and what kind of trends and messages are we sending? Um, and then sales has an even entirely separate agenda they're looking to achieve. And it's all of these different opinions and, and means and methodologies that I think ultimately will, will challenge the ability to ever really become 100% accurate because I don't know that you're ever necessarily going to have a, a singular forecast that satisfies all of those different agendas. That said, 
I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that the, the, the discussion itself is what stimulates kind of the, the healthy business strategy that ultimately will help um, define what any organization is, is looking to achieve. And so in that spirit, I think ultimately the way I approach forecast from a supply chain perspective is there's certainly an element of history that we can lean on that um, is fairly algorithmic. Uh, if I know that I have um, my item in so many stores and so many facings and my run rate is how many units per store per week, that's effectively my, my base, my deseasonalized demand, right? Now, if I then have supplementally some models, which suggest my um, promotional base indices that say, you know, incorporate things like price elasticity and, and duration of, of events, um, that say, hey, we're gonna do this, this outlier, or maybe throw some, some trade spend at, at some merchandising. Here's what we've seen historically is, is the result. Um, so that I think, I think helps slightly less accurate than, than the, your, your base uh, day in, day out business. Um, the element that you can't ever really forecast and the one that, uh, again, going back to the agility that I, I pride myself on is you also don't know what your competition is going to do. Yeah. And, and good and bad, right? So we get phone calls from um, retailers saying, hey, you know, one of your competitors has, uh, is having a supply issue and has presented this opportunity for you. How do you, how do you react there? Well, that is going to be uh, something that you either can do or can't do based on your inventory positioning, but will inherently then introduce noise into the data that if you're using that for history down the line or comparing it versus historicals isn't always there either, um, but that's good. And so I think, you know, to that point, you kind of have to be realistic about what is a forecast. A forecast is at any given point in time, our best assessment as to what are we collectively going to lock arms and prepare for. Um, sometimes you have no idea what's coming, whether it's a, a pandemic or uh, a, a competitor out of stock. Um, and, and that's when you have to flip the agility switch and at the same time be dynamic. So um, it, again, to retur return to your uh, initial question, I think if you're building forecast acumen from the ground up, there is an element of uh, rigor that I think first and foremost does root itself in an analytical mindset that leverages history, but then you have to be able to play the art art side of things. Um, and, and so uh, going back to when, when I had a chance to, to view your conversation with, with Matt Meyer, uh, he, he noted kind of the, the effectiveness of what he called, I believe, uh, is it citizen data scientists? Yeah, citizen data scientists, yeah. Yeah, and, and effectively those individuals that, and there's not a lot of them, to be honest, that can dance between understanding the rigors of the analytics and, and the yeah. data and, and nerd out on that stuff and then turn that into what are the insights? And what does that mean to, to influence and inform the strategy? That's, that's the sweet spot. And when you can introduce that art and science and agility effectively, I think that's, that's the, the differentiating factors that you have, have to kind of adopt as an organization that you're, you're never going never gonna to have 100% forecast accuracy. And so it's, it's probably, that's probably how I would, I would invest in, in that unique skill set, but at the same time, the agility elements as well. No, that is, that is so true. You, you're making this really important point that uh, sales have a lot of uh, metadata, as you're pointing out, opportunities come, uh, promotions, you know, elasticity, market conditions. And when you look at historical data, most companies today, Matt, they don't have that annotations or that metadata on, on sales. It is very difficult to figure out what was going on in the environment in which this sales was happening. What is Matt your advice for uh, colleagues then who uh, handle those types of uh, systems and architectures in an organization or uh, even on the business side to at least have mindfulness that uh, there is a need to create 
annotations and, and metadata, and it has to be somewhat automated because it is not practical for people to do that because you know that process will not be uh, sustainable. So uh, we see that. And then I think the other part of that point, uh, Matt, is that uh, for many organizations, the, there's a lot of uh, unstructured information or tacit knowledge about, okay, my future events, my future promotions, what uh, retailers are planning on doing uh, or my channel is going to do in the future. And that information exists in different pockets uh, of the organization, but uh, it is not in a very structured fashion streaming into uh, some core systems. And you have to think about, okay, well, how, how do you bring that information into accommodation? So what is your advice or maybe, you know, just uh, some color narrative on this specific uh, pattern yeah, it's um, yeah, it, it's certainly a challenge, uh, and and I wish I had an immediate solve for you, but uh, I mean, effectively, there there's something to be said. In order to improve the quality of your data, you have to be able to identify outlying elements and and ascribe um, whether it's via um, you know some sort of uh, of tagging or, or I think we used to call it um, fingerprinting um, some of the data on on some of the. Um, the, the, non, the non de seasonalized stuff right it's event the, 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 and and some of them are, are predicted some of them are are purposeful some of them are, are are promotions they're a little bit easier because you probably have somewhere within your data set that shows a commensurate spend that that yeah. precipitated it um some of the other elements and, and we do see it I, I see data all the time that um, we're looking at um, whether we're anniversarying um a, a data when we're like why why did we have that spike last year again and you kind of have to draw upon you know legacy insight um if you have it now if you didn't have that yeah i, I mean that that certainly it, it creates noise and as somebody who kind of tries to think uh data analytically you know effectively whenever you're trying to to normalize your data you do want to to pull out some of the the outline behavior both, both good and bad um but you also risk if you're not capturing something that that you're not aware of um you know it, it could upset the apple cart pretty quickly so in in that spirit um I, I think there's something to be said about outlying behavior and systemically being able to to not necessarily isolate it but at least be able to uh identify it in some form or fashion with, within your data set that you know says hey this was because there was um there was there was media there was a media spend and hence these lifts are unlikely to occur without that media spend and and just know that these you know that, that this, there's some noise in, in in that regard to the extent that you can or, or something similarly um with respect to to looking forward then um i guess so so you're you're suggesting then um planning across the industry the industry itself effectively has changes both uh, anticipated and unanticipated and it's just um, communicating to be able to anticipate is that effectively what you're you're asking yeah. that and then maybe a side plus in there Matt is that how much importance or resources an organization should allocate to gaining this industry knowledge this industry data because suddenly it is some of it is doable it is a matter of prioritization of these limited, of finite resources. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, my answer would be, it should always be more than what you have because <laughs> I, I find that, um, and, and we contract with, you know, whether there's industry data folks, uh, our own analysts, you tend to get stuck in some of the, the template elements that show, hey, here, here's what your share has done over the last four weeks. Here's what that is compared to, to last year. But you're not always necessarily getting some of the meaningful insights there to somebody that if that was their primary deliverable that ultimately really can that that that's a huge help and then um not even just understanding that at the aggregate but but what's driving that and and to really dive in and so effectively um i'm somebody who again across the the, the people process systems approach to an organization um you know 
if you're not going to have people who you're going to allocate to be able to day in, day out, this is what they do, dive in, understand the data, a true analytics department, and you almost need one uh, for each individual team, right? I would need one to understand the supply chain elements and finance would need one to understand. But um, if you're not willing, and, and rightfully so, it, it's a cost to, to invest uh, in, in the people, there's a lot of systems and tools that can at least identify. They don't always necessarily know what, but they can they can certainly identify gaps, um, a, a, as you know, probably better than anybody, when there's something that just doesn't seem to, to mesh here. There's something, there's some outlying behavior here. There's something funny going on, and it may or may not be a, a harbinger of something then forthcoming as well. And that's why I have an appreciation for kind of this new, um, generation of, of tools, systemic tools that has, has come about, because it does remove a little bit of the inherent um, bias or knee jerk reaction is, well, that must have just been some sort of blip that the competitor must have been doing something. Um, and it really does kind of keep you honest to to dive into some of those um, blips before they become potholes and, uh, you know, real big challenges. And so um, I think effectively, everybody is probably would scream they're under resourced in that capacity. And it's where I'm a strong proponent that what you can't necessarily do with people, you can certainly supplement to a significant degree with the system. Now, what that does is that then challenges an organization on an investment, and, you know, again, sitting on, on a leadership team, everything is a, a business case. I need to understand the ROI and the inherent response is, well, why are you asking for this uh, in investment here and, and, and how do you get it? And I think it's truly understanding a lot of not just the real realizable results. So it's easy to say if you can improve your forecast accuracy by 10%, you can cut your inventory by X, you save this much in networking capital, you've paid for this investment over X period of time. But more so to your point is by not doing this, if and when these sorts of things that are kind of unknown um, happen, there will be financial risk and ramifications to them. And it's really kind of changing the mindset as to what does the investment look like um, to protect you from some of those, those unforeseen things that you can't do if you don't have the luxury of a blank checkbook to just have um, teams and teams and, and, and armies of, of analysts across every, uh, every function within the, the organization. No, spot on. Uh, what do you, Matt, think about uh, this topic of inventory accuracy and an invent and accuracy where, like all nodes everywhere in the supply chain, certain parts more than others. If you, Matt, were to think about inventory accuracy, where would you focus and go about near the demand side, near the supply side, everywhere? And then uh, if you as a chief supply chain officer are you know, looking at prioritization of uh, uh, resources, skills, all that good stuff, and you have to figure out, okay, well, you know, how much accurate you know, shipment uh, demand forecast versus inventory accuracy. Yeah. How would you go about, you know, yeah. determining the relative priority and how important it is to know your accurate inventory position yeah. uh, you know, in relatively near real time. So we'd love to hear your perspective on that. These are all, invest if these are all investments that you are investing in a forecasting capability or you are investing in an inventory, knowing where your inventory is, then what type of returns can be expected from those from those investments? Yeah, and this is something that, um, that you, you kind of phrase it as a hypothetical, but it, it's something I actually am working on a work stream right now to improve our actual physical inventory accuracy across our, our warehouse network. Um, some sites more so than others, we have varying levels of warehouse management system competencies and have had challenges with um, inventory accuracies and, and then when reconciled, whether via um, you know, um, physical inventory counts or, or, or cycle counts, um, it results in real dollar 
adjustments and write-offs. And so, um, you know, the, the, the short answer to your question is the dollars are going to dictate the priority. Um, I do believe, however, that I can make a, 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 an argument that the dollars, and, and certainly you want, you want to improve your inventory accuracy. You always want to have inventory accuracy. Um, anybody who has responsibility for running um, a, a supply chain, specifically one that, that has several different um, warehouses um, that, that, that they use for, for fulfillment, and um, then even more so somebody who's moving inventory uh, between those, those, those warehouses, there is an element of some shrink uh, associated within inventory accuracy to, to some degree. And so it, it kind of then becomes a what's, what's tolerable, what's the cost of doing business versus what is problematic. And um, you know, that, that's what we're dealing with. Ideally, we would be spot on at any given point in time. Being realistic, um, it, it's recognizing we have to do everything we possibly can to ensure the, the inventory accuracy itself does not result in um, especially punitive adjustments and, and, and write downs because those come, I mean, that, that's a direct hit to the p &L and and one that, you know, you got to answer, you got to answer some questions and, and it raises questions, um, certainly rightfully so about your, your inventory control processes and even things like, um, you know, personnel and, and, and security and, and, you know, and those are inherent questions. Um, however, I think I could paint a pretty compelling argument that as far as dollars, if you could improve your forecast accuracy, the dollars that I could save you in managing down networking capital. Yeah. And conversation, I, I, I try to, I, I sound like a broken record and, and I try not to, to beat it too much because um, I want it to resonate, but that's real dollars that you're tying up in, in capital for each little bit of inaccuracy you have within your uh, demand plan um, forecast. And to be able to improve on that is it, 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 the, the improvements go straight to the bottom line. That's dollars that you could put towards anything else, including growing the business um, by whatever means you want to, whether it's media, whether it's trade spend, whatever it is. And I think that those dollars generally tend to be, again, unless you have an extremely problematic um, inventory accuracy problem, probably tend to be higher dollar values than they are uh, on, on the inventory adjustment side of things. But there is an inherent, um, I don't know what the right word is, challenge for somebody who has accountability for inventory control to basically justify, hey, when you're writing things down, it, it does signal that there's problems. And problems need to be addressed more so than the nice to have, which yep. is on the forecast accuracy side of things. So it's um, while the, the priority being dictated by dollars, I think the dollars are viewed a little bit differently when it is an aspirational would be nice to have the improvements in forecast accuracy and the networking capital reductions that come with it versus the problem that we have at the warehouse on inventory accuracy is real. It's right now, it's a have to have in order to fix that because it's leaking out the back door right now. And so um, it's, it's really interesting uh, when, when you think about it in the grand scheme of things. Um, but from an operator perspective, I think we probably need your, to go fix the problem that we have at hand, yeah. fix the boat, uh, and then we'll figure out how do we uh, how do we make the boat a little bit um, you know better, more efficient, streamlined, and uh, you know. So uh, it's it's a long answer to uh, what should be a simple question, but um, as these things tend to be, they're never quite as simple. No, no, so so very true. Another pattern, Matt. Uh, that is very observable is that generally uh, manufacturers are somewhat, uh, there are many layers in between them and, and the consumers and supply chains become uh, less transparent or opaque as you move more into your channel and toward your consumer. And what I mean by that is, Many times your channel or your customers or your retailers, they are 
managing their inventory, they are managing their demand, they are computing, you know, their orders, they are sending you those orders, they expect you to have an awesome portive record, uh, but their systems are a victim of many of these challenges that we have been talking about here. So it makes it even that much harder to forecast what my future Walmart orders or my target orders are going to be. And then uh, when you, you know, from an inventory perspective, uh, you lose visibility into uh, your channel partners, inventory strategies into, you know, where the inventory is in your warehouses versus stores, even though, you know, they share with you policies on, you know, uh, what their inventory carrying policies are. How does that challenge manifest itself and how much can you relate to that challenge, if, if that even if it's a challenge for, from, from your vintage perspective? And then if so, what kind of complexities does it introduce then for uh, somebody sitting in, in your role to manage all these aspects of supply chain where uh, I'm sure one of the expectations that your colleagues have is to compute uh, reliable shipment forecast for your warehouses or your manufacturing facilities. Yeah, well, and um, increasingly, um, not only are we supposed to figure it out, but we're seeing where um, where you have gaps in figuring out there's there's real you know punitive ramifications, whether it's OTIF charges. Um, or even, you know, sometimes, you know, threats of loss of distribution or, or whatever it may be. And, um, you know, so certainly from, from the supply chain execution side, the customer's king um, a, a, as they should be. And a, a true supply chain is just that. It, it's a chain with links. And if one of those links is doing something and not necessarily communicating with the other links, um, you know, it kind of take you back to the, your, uh, you, you know, your, uh, curriculum back in college, it, it, that's when the bullwhip effect can can really kind of come yeah. in and disrupt some things. And that's partly what we're seeing right now. Um, some, although to be fair, more unintended right now, um, but certainly uh, rightfully so. Uh, I mean, retailers are, are a company too. And we don't always necessarily think about the challenges that they are, are up against as a supplier to them, because as a customer is king, we're looking to, to satisfy them, to maximize, maximize our our fill rate and our, our OTIF, um, but you know they they have challenges whether it's open to buy and want to need to run leaner or um, you know change in management approach and and and, and strategy. And if those things are not um, communicated, then they're certainly not analyzed, digested, assessed, and and you know um, being able to, to put into what adjustments do we make on, on our plan. So we do oftentimes find ourselves having to accommodate some things that um, you know we didn't we didn't necessarily see coming, and, and it usually shows up in some um, some of the, the elements you were talking about before. Is, is the data is just not it's just not looking right. It's it disrupted these 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 Walmart or Target orders that you had noted are just not in in line with what we had been uh, accustomed to seeing, good or bad, um, and it. It creates the challenges then that that challenge uh, all these things come full circle back to the, the forecast accuracy and so uh, again uh best crystal ball in, in the world you know unless it's accounting for some of those changes downstream as well um they become disruptive so i, I go back to agility and yeah. so the agility side is being able to run um lean and effective to the extent that you can with the forecast accuracy that you have but at the same time, it's being able to accommodate disruption. And if these disruptions are short-term um, impacts where there, it, it's a downward swing, you have to be able to accommodate and adjust, whether it's future production or procurement, um, so that your, your inventory is not getting um, out, out of whack as a result. Um, if it's resulting in more favorable, all of a sudden there's a, a, a huge bunch of volume coming your way that, that you need to be able to, to adjust. You have to be able to, to pivot to accommodate that because if you don't, that's when the phone calls to your competitors uh, come and, and, and they may be able to and that, and that could have a ramification. So yeah. um, 
I, I like, I, I'm one who subscribes to a lot of, uh, and going back to the systems and some of the new age and new gen tools, a lot of scenario models and scenario management to say, hey, if, if this company, and, and you, you kind of get a feel and, and you know, not a whole lot of secrets about what's going on and it, it, it corporations, if they're going to take a, a huge move, there's usually some sort of been some sort of writing on the wall that, that they're going to do. Um, to say, hey, if, if this retailer is um, going to start to get a little more stingy on orders, how do we pivot and adjust and, and what does that mean to us and be able to play it through all the, the different considerations. So uh, uh, I certainly love the, the scenario modeling capabilities of a lot of the, the new generation tools and, and, and that side of uh, that type of skill set, I think, is, is pertinent to, to people as well. I think our people um, within our organization right now, a lot of what I have uh, I put on their plates is less just day-to-day -day tactical deliverables and more about, hey, can you run me this scenario? If we were to try this funny thing, what is the outcome? Um, and then similarly, those things that we are not directly controlling, if these things impact our business, how do we adjust? How do we accommodate? Uh, and so I try to keep the lines uh, open pretty pretty readily with, with our manufacturing side to be able to pivot up or down. Um, to be candid with a uh, international supply chain, a global supply chain, and some of the three, four month lead times that we have on some of our goods that we procure, whether from Southeast Asia or Europe, um, you know, you don't always get the chance to be able to correct right away, but you do have to be able to identify those disruptors quickly. Yeah. You don't have that bullwhip effect to where next thing you know, it's the whole Suez Canal thing again, right? Is things stopped for a, a, a week or two, and then all of a sudden, all of these ships showed up at the port, and the ports couldn't handle the volume, and it, it just snowballs, and now now we are where we are. And so um, it's it's being able to identify those disruptors in real time. I think there, this is then also where the art element comes in and going back to your conversation about the, uh, the, the sales team, you have to have an effective sales team that is, feels comfortable engaging uh, and to understand and dive into, hey, we're seeing some funniness with your orders. We're seeing some things we weren't expecting here. Let's have a joint business plan discussion, figure out what's going on here and, and how do we, you know, ensure that you know it's not just supply chain it's, it's all of the moving parts within that that um, are, are accounted for no that is uh, that's awesome man so going a little bit deeper into agility and visibility in in your opinion matt what does conscious lead to an organization from your vintage perspective visibility and agility look like like what kind of things, if, if we have good agility, good visibility in a combination of processes, systems, people, what kind of things would it allow us to uh, do? What capabilities we, we would have? What kind of things we can do with that? And you have started talking about that already, but maybe you know, paint your vision of uh, that, what should that? conscious experience feel like? Yeah, um, so agility, I kind of look at it two different ways. It's uh, currently the as is, which I think you need to be mindful of, is, is what are my current competencies, capabilities, um, capacities? Um, what, what can I effectively do if I basically just just step on the accelerator to the extent that, that, that I go and, and, and what, what can we, you know, how, how do we accommodate more and more and more? or then also be able to pivot the other way and start to dial things down within our, our, our current competencies. In order to best operate in that world, it's not just internal kind of self-awareness within your organization, but you know, as I mentioned, I think COVID had showed us that um, you know, your suppliers as well have to be an effective partner in all of that because it does mean no good to, to you know, increase my, my manufacturing plan by double to handle this surge if my supplier of labels and cans and raw materials can't, can't keep up and, and, and be there. So it's engaging them. It is sometimes having to then make commitments, whether it is, um, hey, we're gonna, you know, we're going to live within this, this uh, flex element, or we're gonna carry a little bit more than we would otherwise 
um, to be able to accommodate some of the, the variability that we see. Um, and then it's also, to be frank, it's, it's assessing contingencies. It's, it's calling other op, you know, options is, hey, if you're not able to meet this, I'm gonna have to supplement my, my needs elsewhere. And, and so uh, a lot of the work that we've done has been handling not just maximizing what, what we can do, but um, if a, a partner's you know, not able to, to keep up and we have to pivot to a contingency, what could we do? If we were to have an internal challenge that took a, a, a line or two down, what would we do? And identify some, you know, um, some alternate uh, methods of, of manufacturing to kind of supplement that as well. And so um, it, it all comes back to kind of that scenario model: is, is how high is high, and what would I need to be able to do to accommodate that? And then at the same time, it's being able to flex in such a way that you have, if you have to dial back, you can do so. And I think that's where, um, you know, there's. That's where this 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 noise is going to be very interesting with what you're seeing in, in in commerce with the inflationary period we're seeing is right now there's uh whether it's, it's lumber soy steel whatever it is these commodities are at all time high because it's being driven by the demand for these commodities and so you're seeing these uh, suppliers of these elements um, have to make investments to increase their throughput well what happens when things normalize when um, you know, a, a, a more normal return. How then do they pivot back down? Because, and that's part of what you're seeing in the way that's manifesting itself with all of the the news you're hearing about um, organizations having trouble finding personnel and labor. Yeah. Is you know you have to they have to to ramp up the, the the people, and even to the extent that they do, well, what happens when things normalize? You'd hate to think that you know they have to correct back the other way as well, but you have to be able to to accommodate those things, and so. That's kind of living within the as is. And then secondarily, I think you have to be mindful of a, a 2B level of, of agility that says, okay, all of this known, what, what more could I do with a little more investment, right? And so I, I can tell you, so my, our manufacturing plant kind of specializes in just standard canned, you know, items. Um, we then procure finished goods for some other alternate packaging that we don't have the capabilities there, but you start to kick the tire and say, well, what if we made the investment that allowed us to package this at this location as well? It gives us not just increased uh, capacities and, and help you to better um, you know, maximize the throughput of this, this plant, which helps things like conversion cost and, and kind of the, the, the viability of, of the plant, but also at the same time, kind of gives you then also those contingency supplies from, from where you're, you're procuring it now, um, but there's a cost to do so. And so it's, it's playing some of those things out as to what do we want it to be in a, in a, a perfect agile world. So if I, if I got a chance to kind of draw that out from scratch, it's not just optimizing within the core competency now, but ancillary to that, what other elements would we want to be able to consider that we could additionally bring in and what new avenues does that open up? So we've been approached by other, um, you know, other, other companies that are looking for capacity to, to help co-pack some of their product. Yeah. Um, and, you know, certainly love those conversations um, because that, that does help, help me with my, my plant costs and, and, and the absorption there and to have those types of, of conversations as such, but you have to do the investment to get there. And it kind of comes back to the system side of things. Everything being a business case, everything being ROI, you then have to have a mind's eye. It says, okay, within the world of agility, we know we can optimize to this. But if we were to invest this, we can go even further to this extent. Yeah. And that's the game changer, right? That's that's what kind of transforms a PL in, in a way. And so those are the exciting conversations to get to consider. Um, they're never easy conversations because they're very um and anything that deals with, with capital expenditure tends to be um, met with uh, a, a lot of scrutiny. So they're never quick and easy, but they're, they're exciting nonetheless. I think a follow-up question to Matt that is then visibility that is sort of a companion to agility. What, what does visibility and visibility related capabilities look like? How do you know you have good visibility or not? Uh, and then, uh, of course, data plays a big role in it. Uh, so if somebody 
is starting on that journey, your advice for you know somebody who is early on in their visibility agility journey, and then as a, a business person who have a great understanding of technology, your advice for chief data officers or people who are responsible for data stewardship, data governance, data federation, to make sure that the data layer can support agility and yeah. can support visibility. And of course, you know, they also have finite resources and where to prioritize and whatnot. So I think, you know, a twofold question that what does visibility look like? And then your sort of, you know, advice for people who are responsible for data or just starting on this journey that what to prioritize, what, what to do first, what to do second kind of a thing. Visibility is, is, um, is, is interesting. And I've seen it really kind of shift throughout the years and take on quite a bit of, of meaningful importance. Um, you know, it certainly was around when RFID was being, um, you know, tabbed as the, the next best thing to improve visibility. And um, I think it was extremely cost prohibitive at, at, at the get-go. And, um, you know, certainly it, it never quite got off the ground as yeah. uh, some of the supply chain scholars thought it, it was going to be the kind of the next, you know, UPC and, and, and whatnot. Um, but that said, is in that time since there's only been more and more importance to visibility. So if you think if you take off your business hat and just put on your consumer hat, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I'd assume uh, like, like me, you probably get emails, text messages telling you when you have uh, an Amazon package out for yeah. delivery, right? And even to the extent now where you can pull it up on a map and it says, hey, it's six stops away. And it's gotten to a point where consumers expect that. And that is something that's become more and more prevalent, you know, just, just globally. And um, so customers, uh, businesses expect that. And um, that's why things like, uh, you know, the OTIF, um, you know, the guidance is there. And, and so um, visibility is absolutely, it, it's, it's paramount. Um, but to your point, I don't think we're at a point where we have quite optimized it just yet. And I know um, certainly coming from a position I'm at where tracking and tracing of our raw materials is of the utmost importance to us uh, and, and part of our mission statement and what we stand for as a company. I can tell you a lot of that activity is, is supported probably with more manual effort. You'd be surprised at, as to how much of that is, is actually manually still entered and transferred via, you know, whether it's uh, Excel spreadsheets and um, keyed in, 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 in some um, rare instances. And so, there's an, an automation element that I think is still forthcoming. And I think that's where maybe something like uh, blockchain types of uh, technologies and, and, and those types of things, um, I'm fascinated to see where, where they go. I think that um, you know, cryptocurrency is certainly in, an interesting jumping off point, but I think I, I get excited about some of the opportunities as to where something like a blockchain can take these types of, of, of elements because you know, it, it kind of being um, an irrefutable document history of things, somebody who has to, you know, provide tracking and tracing, um, there's something to be said. I, I was reading somewhere that um, like 26 to 87 percent of all of the uh, seafood that is, um, that, and I think it's part of that, that subway um, thing that, that's being scrutinized out there is, is mislabeled. And, you know, in, in my mind goes to, you know, blockchain elements and, and transfer of ownership and, and all the way through, there's the irrefutable elements that if you can't adjust these things, you can't hack these things. Um, that's the visibility that I think consumers expect. And that expectation is, um, is one that I think, I think the infrastructure is coming. I don't know if we're quite there yet, but um, I'm, I'm certainly excited about it, both both as a business person and, and, and as a consumer who's looking for my Amazon packages. So. Yeah, no, no two ways about it, man. So I think that leads into a good sort of uh, next uh, topic of uh, innovation and, and digital transformation. If Matt, you were to think about supply chain innovation, supply chain excellence, 
what type of experiments you would conduct or things that you would do uh, to further innovate and push the envelope. You just alluded to some potential use cases for uh, blockchains, but just in general on the topic of uh, supply chain innovation, uh, what sort of things you know, are sort of on your thinking list to say, okay, well, you know, this is what I want to try or do. Uh, yeah. So there's an interesting dynamic. So uh, over the last, uh, I don't know, decade, 15 years or so, you, you heard the, the word omni-channel kind of catch on where, you know, you have to be able as a supplier to supply, um, you, you know, those that do business brick and mortar, those that do business e-commerce, uh, and, and then a lot of those that kind of operate, you know, um, across the different segments. Um, I think we've gotten to a point now where if you are not in each and every segment, whether it's, you know, um, you know, uh, click and then pick up or, um, you know, e-commerce direct to home and also have uh, brick and mortar, you're kind of at a disadvantage. And I think those that started in, in the direct e-commerce world, the Amazons of the world, you're starting to see them get storefronts. And then uh, similarly, you're seeing Walmart and their .com take on of, of greater importance as you really have to kind of be all things to all consumers because consumers expect it similar to, to the visibility aspect. I think as a supplier, then it puts us in, a, in an interesting perspective to help support some of those things. Um, you know, traditionally you have most suppliers are, they, they live in the B2B or the direct to consumer world. And I think we're getting to a point where you have to be able to, to coexist across both. And I think there's probably it's still probably early stages where it, supply chains are not quite optimized to handle that, right? So if you think back to even legacy ERP systems, you're kind of structured in, in such a format to optimize your business, to work with other big businesses and execute POs to the same ship two points, you know, frequently, however, however so frequently. Um, but um, if you were to then say, hey, I need you to use this existing ERP infrastructure and start to ship to people's homes, well, the way that ERP is structured, it views each and every order now as a new ship to, which means yeah. you have to create new records. And, and so it, it's really clunky, right? And, yeah. and so I think, I think the systemic support side has some work to do to be able to exist in, in both those worlds. And it's part of the reason that you see, and it's still taken years and it's still not perfected, those that are even on the front end where you're having now, um, they call them the, uh, the 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 dark stores or whatever they uh, where they they actually have the the storefront itself yeah. to, sh to ship to, to people's homes. Um, it's a tends to be a whole different systemic infrastructure versus what they have otherwise. And so when you ship, oftentimes to to Walmart, for instance, you're shipping to a separate DC sometimes to, for their Walmart.com business versus if you're just shipping to ultimately wind up on a a, a storefront. And so it's harmonizing across the different platforms in a way that I think we still in the supply chain world have a ways to go. And I think we're gonna have to lean on, on the system side of things to help kind of purposefully blur the lines there as to what, what does it look like? Who are we shipping to and, and in what form or fashion? So I think that's, I think that's where I would focus, um, focus my efforts to, to really kind of be truly uh, cutting edge on the supply chain side. What do you organization you think is needed to go along with that. And what I mean by that is today you have colleagues who are supply site focused, some demand side, some sales, some marketing. Some people speak more units language. Some people speak their dollars language. What, and then in terms of organizational models, it could be from silos on one end to you know, centralized or mm -hmm. centers of excellence approach in between to loose coalitions and alliances and different collaborative models. What do you may think about? And certainly it's a highly context sensitive topic. So there is no single right answer, but what are different types of organizational models for a more connected enterprise uh, well suited for this type of 
a future where you know you need to innovate for omni-channel. It requires all those capabilities, and then you know we talked about uh, all those other things: uh, agility, cap capabilities, visibility, uh, other things. So, how do you take an organization of today and morph it to newer models uh, so that there is sort of more alignment between these goals, objectives, and the structure of this organization. Yeah, and it's something I think a lot of organizations are, are trying to figure out because um, to take you know, the older model um, approach, it, it's certainly not necessarily working. And so what I've seen over the past, I've seen a couple of different ways to try to slice it is, is you have, uh, I'll just take sales as an example, you have sales because they generally tend to have retailer um, responsibility and they're structured as such. Um, and so all of a sudden you have one guy who's in charge of, of, of e-commerce, for instance. I think that you know organizations are finding that's, that's not working because this guy over here that calls on this retailer, that retailer has e-commerce, right? And so it really muddies the water now as to, and so you really, it, it, it comes, everything, all roads keep leading back to agility here. It starts getting into skill sets that are deployable. You have to have um, an ability to think through the different um, the elements of business. And, you know, it's, I go back to, you know, even yeah, that, that, as you have familiarity with that, the home entertainment days as to, um, being able to recognize that it's not even as simple as, you know, Walmart separate from walmart.com, but you have Walmart with um, physical media, but then you also have, you know, Walmart has voodoo with digital elements too. And you have to have somebody that knows all those moving parts and can approach that entire um, entity holistically, because I think that's where the, the meaningful scale comes in, right? You have to think of your business as your own little entrepreneurial um, endeavor. And so you have to have a skill set of individuals who think entrepreneurially. And so you're, you don't necessarily have a salesperson so much as you truly do have somebody who manages the entirety of the business and the entirety of the business agnostic of just the uh, shelves and the, the uh, you know, the pro space facings that, that you're given. And because they also have to deal with the dot-com side of things and the digital elements and even some of the, you know, the marketing considerations and, and, and those pieces. So you really have to start to think a little more broadly about yeah. the job description and not having it um, structured in such a form and fashion that, that, you know, it starts here, ends here, because the world's changing and it's, world ch it's changing so quickly in such a way that it's, it's only a matter of time before you have, you know, you have to talk to your, your counterpart about their ancillary uh, TikTok initiatives and, and understand what they mean and be able to figure out how do you fit in and how do you support that and what does it mean to your business? And so um, the old legacy mindset of having a specialist on everything, I think is gonna become antiquated. And I think the, the competitive advantage really kind of becomes in having the, the breadth of experience as opposed to the depth of expertise. What other advice, Matt, uh, you have for business analysts or people who are running supply chain business, different uh, types of supply chain analysts, uh, somebody who is either getting into this line or somebody who is retooling herself or himself into uh, all these brave new needs of, of supply chains of today and tomorrow. So what advice do you have for them in terms of, of where to invest their time, what kind of skills, soft skills and hard skills to build and learnability, aptitude. Uh, so I think that would be a good topic for us to uh, sort of kind of bring everything that we have been talking about to just bring it to a convergence, I think that would be a good end point for our conversation. Yeah, I, I mean, it, the reality is, uh, and it's not necessarily you need a supply chain, but certainly uh, it's a huge competitive advantage. If you are a doer and you are in the weeds and you're a true analyst and you get into the data and the scrutiny, 
if you then can develop your ability to get yourself out of the weeds and understand and tell this story and start to bring the art in, that is that finite skill set that, as I alluded to the, the, the Matt Meyer conversation, I think is interesting to me in that it's so specialized. I have had people who work for me who are absolute geniuses, um, but at the same time, they don't feel comfortable jumping in front of the boardroom to talk to a, a CFO or CEO to say, hey, what does this mean? And they really get in, they, they live because it's what they do all day on, you know, the, the intricacies of the, the models and the statistical regression analyses that were performed. And so you have to kind of be able to, to put your then more uh, enterprise hat on and say, well, what is this telling me that this group then can use to inform their strategy making? So it's that level of being able to live at the 50,000 foot view while also being way down in the weeds. And that, that takes a little bit of time. It's probably easier to start in the weeds and start to develop yourself to get to the 50,000 foot view than, than vice versa. Uh, I mean, certainly you, you can do it. Most people don't necessarily start from that view with aspirations to really get into to, to the granulars, but um, you, you can certainly do it. So again, somewhat related to agility, but you have to be able to um, relate to your audience at hand, You know, understand your audience and be able to determine, are we talking strategy or are we talking day-to-day -day doing? And that I think is, is, is critical to be able to maneuver in there. And then additionally, as I mentioned, that the world is changing very, very quickly. And yeah. so you can't get locked in with, um, you know, things like um, uh, very, very static models, for instance. So, yeah. you know, back in, in school, it was pretty simple. Your, you know, your reorder points and, and, and what those things look like. And those concepts still hold true. The problem is that things are moving at such an accelerated pace. And that's where the agility piece comes in. You have to be able to adapt and shift and pivot and um, be able to adjust to things not always necessarily being as served up as, as tidy as a, a planner like myself would like for them to be. And so um, having a little bit of a, a, of a thick skin when things don't always necessarily go as, as perfectly prescribed and your forecast accuracy is not 100%, um, to be able to adjust to what does that mean to, to the business. And that's where I think some of the tools um, really come in to, to help with that. Uh, and then the other big piece is um, complete and total candor is you, you just have to be able to explain. It's, uh, I, I find myself probably now more so than, than any time in, in recent history, having very difficult conversations about what's going on in the world of costs of goods sold. Because yeah. I mean, you know, commodities are, er, er, all prices are rising. Certainly transportation rates and probably even more so international vessel shipping rates. And to be able to have those conversations you're not saving anybody anything by trying to soften the blow when you tell them, look, we're going to have to take price up because these are true inflationary impacts that we have to consider. And so um, it, it takes a, a little bit of, of skill set. I think people tend to kind of want to not have to be the communicator of bad news. But I think that uh, in terms of really being able to um, be successful within the supply chain world, People, we, we take for granted that, that people seem to, they must know these things. Well, they're not doing the supply chain stuff that we're doing all day, every day. And so I do have to sit down and explain to people, hey, these ocean vessel costs are two, two and a half times what they would normally be otherwise. And here's why. And, you know, here's at least uh, our best guess as to how long this is going to prevail. Now let's see what does this do to the business. And so, um, it's having that level of connectivity to be able to take what we view to be just our standard day-to-day -day stuff, but socialize it into the broader organization. Because uh, as I think we even started our conversation, the, the lines as to where supply chain begins and ends have blurred so yeah. much to the extent that um, we're basically, you know, just another seat at that, at that table as a, how, to, how does this whole organization work? This has been, Matt, my friend, awesome. And thank you for being so generous with your time. And I learned a lot. I'm sure that everybody who's gonna to listen to it, they're gonna pick up a lot of very useful points. 
a lot of practitioners listen to it. And uh, yeah, and I look forward to our, our future, future conversations and I'll uh, keep you posted uh, as well as things, uh, things progress on this podcast. Uh, so extremely, sir, appreciate oh, it. No, I love it. I always love getting to catch up. Uh, it, it's, um, yeah, you're somebody I've always enjoyed, always enjoyed working with intimately. So uh, the chance to chat was, was the most compelling element. And so um, definitely please, please keep in touch. And I always love to, to nerd out about supply chain, macroeconomics and, and all this fun stuff. So you have a willing, uh, a willing audience if you ever want to just geek out. Very, very true.